Today what we're going to do is derive formulas for kinetic energy, gravitational potential energy, and elastic potential energy, and then apply them in a few simple situations. In the previous video, we said that work was equal to the change in energy. And work was given by force times distance. So let's imagine a situation where, say we've got an inclined plane, and we've got a block on that inclined plane, and we're going to push that block with a force F. And let's say we move it up the incline by a distance D. And of course the work done would be equal to F times D. Now there's a number of different energy transformations that can occur as a result of that push, as a result of that work. One thing is that perhaps your box is now moving faster. And well, if it's moving faster, it's got more motional energy, there's going to be an increase in the kinetic energy of the box. And let's just give that an arbitrary value. Let's say that was equal to 500 joules. A second energy transformation that might occur would be an increase in height energy, an increase in what we call gravitational potential energy. So the box is now up higher. So let's say there's an increase in the gravitational potential energy of 400 joules. And then we might consider, well, let's suppose there was some sort of spring attached. So that we were compressing a spring as we pushed up the box. Then there'd be some energy stored in the spring, and we call that elastic potential energy. And let's say the increase in elastic potential energy was 200 joules. And then of course if there's any friction on the surface here, then we would produce some heat energy. So let's say that there was a some added heat energy. And let's make that 100 joules. Now if those are the only transformations that occur, and we add all of that up, and that adds up to 1200 joules, then the work done by this force would have to be 1,200 joules. So we can keep track of where the energy is going. We can do some bookkeeping, and that allows us to do all kinds of neat calculations. So what we're going to try to do now is work out formulas for kinetic energy, gravitational potential energy, and elastic potential energy. So here's how we're going to go about finding these formulas for kinetic energy, gravitational potential energy, and elastic potential energy. Basic method starts with the idea that work is equal to change in energy. But we're going to do our work in such a way that only one type of energy transformation occurs at a time. So in our first case, we'll do work, and of course work is equal to force times distance, but we're going to do it in such a way that there's only changes in kinetic energy. And then in our second case, we're going to do work in such a way that there's only changes in the gravitational potential energy. And in the third case, we're going to do work in such a way that there's only changes in the elastic potential energy. So let's begin our first proof. We're going to try to get a formula for the kinetic energy of a body. So we're going to apply a force, cause this mass to move a certain distance d. But we're going to do it in such a way that there are no other changes in energy except for changes in kinetic energy. In other words, we don't want to do this on an incline. We want to do this on a flat surface so there's no changes in height. We want to do this on a frictionless surface so that there's no heat being produced. And of course, there's no springs attached, so there's no elastic potential energy. The only thing that's going to change for this object is it's going to be moving faster when it gets here. There's going to be an increase in the kinetic energy. So with all these proofs, we start with work equals the change in energy. Of course, the work is equal to force times distance. And the only type of energy change we're going to have in this particular example will be a change in kinetic energy, which would really be the final kinetic energy minus the initial kinetic energy. Now, let's take our initial speed 
to be zero. So it doesn't have any kinetic energy initially. So this is going to be zero. And our final speed, we'll say, is V. So what I've now got is that the final kinetic energy should be equal to force times distance. And it's this final kinetic energy that I want to find out. Now, kinetic energy should depend on how fast objects are going and how much mass they have. Objects with lots of speed and lots of mass, they do the most damage. They have the most kinetic energy. So I'd like to get rid of these variables f and d and try to get them into masses and speeds. Well, of course, by Newton's second law, force is equal to mass times acceleration. And then we've got d here. And we like that because acceleration can be expressed in terms of velocities or speeds. It will equal the change in speed over time, v final minus v initial all over t. And we still have a d in our expression. Now our initial speed, that was zero. So we can take that out and we get that m times v final. I'm going to take this t for time and place it underneath the d. And the reason I want to do that is because distance over time is going to be speed. Of course, it's the average speed. It's not the same here as the final speed. In fact, because our speed increases at a linear rate against time, it has constant acceleration. That means that our final speed here is just going to be twice as big as our average speed. V average is just going to be Vf divided by 2. So we can write this as m v final times v final all over 2, or a half m v final squared. And now in general, we don't really need that f for final. We could just write that the kinetic energy of a body will be given by 1 half m times the speed squared. That's our formula for kinetic energy. Let's take a look at an example of how we'd use the expression for kinetic energy. So we want to find out how much work it takes to speed up a one kilogram car from two meters per second to seven meters per second. And then we want to find out if it takes the same amount of work if we speed it up from seven to 12 instead of from two to seven. So in both cases, of course, we have a five meter per second speed change. Does it always take the same amount of work to get the same speed change? Let's take a look. So we start with work equals change in energy, but the only type of energy change we're having here is kinetic energy. The change in any quantity is the final value minus the initial value. Plugging into our formula for kinetic energy, we're going to have a half m v final squared minus one half m v initial squared. Common factor out the one half m, and I get this expression. And now I'll substitute my numbers in. My mass is 1. My final speed was 7. My initial speed was 2. Work that out, and you should get 22.5 joules. So let's see if we get the same answer if we speed up from 7 to 12. So I'm going to just substitute into this expression here. It's going to be 1 half. The mass is 1 still. But my final speed now is 12. That gets squared. My initial speed is 7. That gets squared. Work out the math. You'll get an answer this time of 47.5 joules. This is more energy than the previous case. And I point out this example because students often make a subtle mistake. They make the mistake that a half m v final squared minus v initial squared is the same thing as a half m v final minus v initial all squared. And that is not true at all. If they were the same, then we would have got the same answers here. This is the correct expression. Don't use this here. It's not the same thing. Let's see if we can derive a formula for the gravitational potential energy. So we always do this the same way. We say that the work is equal to the change in energy. 
but we're going to do our work in such a way that it only changes gravitational potential energy. So that implies two things. One thing is there's no friction again, so no heat energy is produced. But the other thing is that it has to be at constant speed, that we have to lift our object up at constant speed because delta Ke has to be zero. We can't have any change in the kinetic energy. And we know something about the forces on objects that move with constant speed. The two forces acting are going to be this upward force F that we're exerting to lift it and the weight. And they're going to have to be exactly the same size if we're going to move upwards at constant speed. So the size of mg will be the same as the size of F. Let's assume that the height is zero on the ground here and the height would equal some final value when it gets lifted. So work is a force times distance and our change in GPE will be the final value minus the initial value. Our force has to be the same size as the weight of the object so it moves up constant speed. We're going to lift it through a distance h and our initial gravitational potential energy will take that to be zero because we're starting with zero height. So we end up with this expression for gravitational potential energy. The gravitational potential energy will equal mg times the height of the object above the ground. Let's try an example where we use this formula for the gravitational potential energy. We're looking for the work done against gravity when a 50 kilogram object is raised from 5 meters to 20 meters. So pause the video, try the question, come back for the answer. So the work is going to equal the change in energy and they really threw in this phrase against gravity because if we're just talking about a person lifting this object from the second to the seventh floor, they would actually have to do a lot more work than this because there would be friction involved and there'd likely be all kinds of work done in moving our object horizontally. But when we stick in this phrase against gravity, then the work that we're talking about is simply that change in gravitational potential energy. The final value of the gravitational potential energy minus the initial value, which would be mg times the height, final height minus mg times the initial height and we might common factor that mg out of our expression. Substituting our values in, we've got 50 kilograms. Let's just take g to be 10, and we're going to raise our object by some 15 meters, 20 meters minus 5 meters. I'll let you do the math, but it should come out to be 7,500 joules of work have to be done against gravity in order to lift the mass. You might hear it said that gravity is a conservative field. But all that means is that the work done against gravity only depends on the height changes, only depends on the changes in gravitational potential energy. So if I specify some height, then the work done against gravity does not depend on path. So I can go straight up, I can go at an angle, I can do a loop-de-loop, -loop. I can go up and back, it doesn't matter. The path does not matter. All of these instances would have the same work done against gravity, the same increase in gravitational potential energy. Let's see if we can find the formula for the elastic potential energy stored in a spring. And of course, we're going to proceed exactly the same way. We're going to say the work is equal to the change in only the elastic potential energy. So we're not going to allow any transformations into kinetic energy, etc. So let's suppose this is our spring. And right here, that's where the spring is relaxed. There's no forces. And let's call that position of the spring, we'll call that x initial equal to zero. And we're going to 
push our spring inwards. I could compress it or extend it. I'm going to compress it inwards and I'm going to bring it to some a final position x equals x final. So I'm pushing it from here to here. Now if I don't want any transformations into the other forms of energy then of course I've got to do it on a horizontal surface. So my height is constant. I'm going to have to do it in a frictionless environment. And I'm also going to have to do it at constant velocity so that there's no change in the kinetic energy. And that turns out to be a little bit tricky because if we think about that, if I compress my spring just a little bit, the spring just pushes back with a little bit of force. There's the force of the spring. But if I push the spring in farther, of course the spring force gets bigger. So now if we're going to have constant velocity the whole way, we've got to have no net force. That means the force that we're pushing with is going to have to grow. It's going to have to be quite large with large compressions and quite small with small compressions. But it always has to balance out the force in the spring. So if we're going to work this out, we need to know the way that forces change inside of springs. And that's described by Hooke's Law. So this is what Hooke's Law basically says. Let's suppose we've got a spring. And there it is at its relaxed length. No elastic potential energy stored in the spring. And then we compress it. So let's say we compress it. Nice easy number. Let's make it two centimeters. Then of course, because we compressed it, there's going to be a force back from the spring. And we'll call that force F. Now what we're going to do is double that compression. So instead of it being 2 centimeters, we're going to make it 4 centimeters. And what Hooke's Law says is this. If you double that compression, or it could be an extension, then the force from the spring will also double. In other words, the force from a spring, like the magnitude of the force from a spring, is proportional to the stretch or compression. Now we might write that a little more formally or a little more mathematically. The magnitude of the force vector is proportional. Well, it's proportional to this distance here. And we had defined positions xi equal to 0 and, and x equal to xf. So we could talk about a displacement vector going from xi to xf, and it's the magnitude, the length of that vector, that's proportional to the force. So this is just the magnitude of the vector from the relaxed position to wherever the spring is stretched or compressed. Now, of course, whenever we have a proportional relationship, we can always write that with an equality and a constant. So we can write it like that. It turns out this k is kind of interesting, the proportionality constant. It's called the spring constant. And it's a measure of how stiff the spring is. So very stiff springs have high spring constants. And if we rearrange our equation here, we get that that k is going to equal the magnitude of the force divided by the magnitude of the displacement. So the units for this k are going to be newtons of force divided by length units. So let's make our length unit say centimeters. If we had a k constant of say 23 newtons per centimeter, that would mean if you stretch your spring by one centimeter, and assuming you didn't distort your spring, you'd get a force of 23 newtons. And if you stretched it by two centimeters, you'd get a force of 46 newtons, etc. Now that we know Hooke's Law, let's see if we can work out our expression for the elastic potential energy. So of course, work here is force times distance. It's going to equal elastic potential energy in the final state minus elastic potential energy in the initial state. But in the initial state, our spring is relaxed, so it's not storing any energy, and that means this term will be zero. So we end up with EPE final equals F times D. Now, we've got a little problem because this F here, it varies. So being as it varies, let's just take an average value for it. So we're going to write this as F average 
times d. Now the d that we're talking about is this distance here. That's how far we're moving our spring inwards. And that's simply what we've called the magnitude of the displacement. And now what we can do is use Hooke's law to determine this average force. So Hooke's law says that the magnitude of the force is proportional to the magnitude of the displacement. And that means we get a linear graph here that goes through the origin. And if we take some particular magnitude of the displacement, we'll call it just delta x magnitude, then by Hooke's law, the force has to be k times that magnitude of the displacement. And being as this is a linear function, the average force is simply going to be half that value. It's going to be k delta x divided by 2. That is, the average force is going to be k times the magnitude of the displacement all over 2. So let's plug that in. k delta x magnitude all over 2. So we get here that the elastic potential energy is going to equal 1 half times k times the magnitude of the displacement squared. So you want to notice here that the formula for elastic potential energy in a spring is very much like the one for kinetic energy. Both have a half out in front, both then have a constant, mass is generally constant, and then both have a magnitude squared. Speed is the magnitude of velocity. So the two forms are very similar. Let's try a question where we use our formula for elastic potential energy. Pause the video, read the question over, try it out for yourself, come back for the answer. So we're asked for this elastic potential energy. And we know elastic potential energy is given by 1 half kx squared. Now, they don't give us k directly in the problem. So somehow we're going to have to figure that out. The x value is going to be how far it's stretched from its relaxed position or compressed. So that's going to be its relaxed length was 20 centimeters. It's been compressed to 7 centimeters. So therefore, x is 13 centimeters. And we have to be careful here. This formula is an SI formula, meaning it's going to give us energy in joules if we've got k in newtons per meter and we're going to have to have x in meters. So we're going to have to write this as 0 0.13 meters if we want to express our elastic potential energy in joules. Now this process here of hanging a mass on a spring can be used to determine the spring constant. And that's all we need now. If we can find the spring constant, we can determine the elastic potential energy. So originally, we had a 20 centimeter long spring. And then we hung a mass on it, and it stretched to 30 centimeters. So we've got a stretch here of 10 centimeters. But we also know the force of the spring, because if that's the equilibrium position, the forces have to be balanced. So the weight of gravity, mg, has to exactly balance off the force of the spring. And the force of a spring is given by the spring constant times how far it's stretched. So we get that kx must equal mg. So k must be equal to mg divided by x. So if we plug in our numbers, we're going to get 0.5 kilograms. g is to be taken as 10. And we're stretching by 10 centimeters, but remember, that's 0 0.1 meters. So our spring constant in newtons per meter is going to be 50 newtons of force for every meter of stretch. So now let's take this value and substitute it in here. Our elastic potential energy is going to be 1 half times 50 newtons per meter 
times 0 0.13 meters all squared. We're in SI units. This is going to give us an answer in joules. Work it out. You should get 0 0.42 joules. Here's an IB question. Pause the video, try the question, come back for the answer. If you did it correctly, you should have got a, you should have got an answer of 45 newton centimeters. Notice here that the units for energy are not SI units. Otherwise, they would have written 45 joules. But newtons times centimeters is acceptable energy units. They're just kind of unusual. Three different ways that you might go about doing this problem. One would be to say work is equal to the area under a force times distance graph. So our initial position was right here at 3, our final position was at 6, and so we need to calculate this area here. And you would probably divide that into two sections, area 1 and area 2. Work that out and you should get 45 Newton centimeters. Second way to do the problem would be to say that work is equal to the change in elastic potential energy or one half k x final squared minus one half k x initial squared, which would equal one half of k. K is just the slope of this graph. It's going to be twenty divided by six. And then x final was the six centimeters, subtract off the initial three centimeters squared. And once again, you should get an answer of 45 Newton centimeters. Third way to do it, and perhaps the easiest, would be to say that work would be equal to the average force times its change in position, x final minus x initial, the distance over which that average force was applied. And being as our force increases in a linear way, the average force between 3 centimeters and 6 centimeters would be right here at 15. That would be F average. So we'd get an answer there 15 times 6 minus 3 to give 45 Newton centimeters. So in summary we derive three equations. We have one for kinetic energy, 1 half mv squared, one for gravitational potential energy, mg times h, and one for elastic potential energy, one-half k x squared. Keep in mind when you're doing the problems that it's really the energy transformations that are important, that is the changes in energy. So we can talk about the change in kinetic energy being one-half m v final squared minus v initial squared. And the change in gravitational potential energy being mg h final minus h initial, or just delta h. And the elastic potential energy change would be given by 1 half k final position of the spring squared minus the initial position of the spring squared, where those positions are measured from the relaxed position of the spring. And that's all for today, folks. Thank you very much.